I got thinking about this because one of the things that people have a problem with is a lot of people will tell you that Christ died for their sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. Well, that's great. And don't ever think that I don't believe that the gospel is the power of God. It can be read in any church in America and somebody gets saved. That's that I know that. I believe that. But there are things that do not happen with that. And also, there's an issue of trust. If the <clears throat> preacher, which is by the preaching, if he doesn't show the simplicity of it, so that a person can just trust that, then they'll say that, but then they'll do some other things with it, and they don't have the peace that goes if you trust. But I, I don't. I want to get ahead of myself. I want you to look at First Timothy two and verse three. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. God is a Savior. Psalm three says salvation belongs unto the Lord. God made and he can save, all right? God knows how to save. God knows how he wants people to be saved. He knows what takes to be saved on and on. That's God. Who will have all men to be saved and connect, conjunction there and that connection and to come into the knowledge of the truth. Now, not only was Paul saved, he had knowledge about that salvation. And in this knowledge comes this peace. Um, there are things that Paul says in his writings that if you don't know those, you can get tossed to and fro. You can get uh, always unrest. And uh, people can be motivated to do much of anything. And people can be misled. Uh, they think still, I mean, the moment a person gets saved, he doesn't know that the Most High doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. And he he doesn't know things that Paul stated, like in Acts 17, and he doesn't know that uh, that he should come out from among them as 2 Corinthians 6. He doesn't, he doesn't necessarily know that thing. And he still may believe that religion is serving God. But there is a thing in him, if he's truly saved, that's, that's going to lead him if you'll let it. And of course, Paul says, quench not the spirit, but also they, they may not ever grow. Uh, the Corinthians were having trouble and he said, you're still carnal. And uh, Paul said uh, when he was young, he was, a, he was like a child, but when he became knowledgeable and whatever, he became a man. Well, the idea is to become a man by growth. But now look in verse four who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Now, this is Paul assuring Timothy as a preacher the correctness of this all. Verse 7, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Okay. Now, it takes the gospel of Christ to be saved. Now, it's the power. Look in Romans 1. Now, this is simple, but I want you to look at this because it's a lot of times a tragedy happens and people get together religiously and, and then they begin to be fearful and all things are happening. People talk about the Jesus Christ and about his death, burial, and resurrection, so forth and so on. And people begin to think, well, that's uh, this, these people are all right after all. Okay. But it comes down to the point if you were to ask them the gospel of their salvation, what is it? They still can't tell you because death, burial, and resurrection is not the simple truth. That doesn't have to be added. It, it has to be added to in religion. It, it, uh, and we're going to see these things. We're going to see how, what it in religion, what it, uh, what the God, the cross, the preaching cross does in religion. Okay, now what? Romans sixteen, uh, Romans one sixteen. For I'm not ashamed. Now that shame there. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Paul was a Benjamite, a Pharisee, uh, 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 a 
Hebrew of the Hebrews. And for him to say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the gospel of Christ then must be something against what Paul believed all his life. And it is. You see that in Philippians 3. He, he said, if you think you got something to brag in the flesh, I'm more. When you can't brag in the flesh, when, when all your bragging rights are taken from you, and you have to glory in something that you didn't do, and you have to admit that you have to submit to somebody that was better than you and somebody that knew what to do and you didn't do, and on and on, then it becomes a point of, am I going to be ashamed? Are they going to make me ashamed? And Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And he emphasizes the gospel of Christ. Not He didn't say, I'm, I'm not ashamed uh, of the gospel. He didn't leave it just the gospel. Why? Gospel is preached in all the churches. That's what they tell you. They'll, they say, I preach the four gospels. I preach the gospel. The gospel. But what is the gospel that you should preach? And gospel means good news. That's what people say. Well, in Ephesians 1, when you heard of the good news of your salvation, well, we have to understand, how did God save me? I, I thought I walked the aisle. I thought I turned from my sins. I thought I confessed my sins. I thought I gave my life to Christ. Uh, I, I, I. But what is the gospel of your salvation? What's the good news of your salvation? How did God save you? I mean, you got to think about this. How did God save you? Then if, if God saved me, how did he save me? Did did he save me because I turned from my sin? Did he save me because I did good work? Did he save me because I turned from evil things and, and started living the best I could and treat my neighbor right and all that? How did God save me? Well, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. And it's based on believing it, okay? Believing the gospel. And of course, that's Ephesians 1.13 again. But look in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This, this enlightens us. And these are nothing new. Understand. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. But if our gospel, now the word our, having to do with something that belonged to Paul and whoever he preached to. Now remember, hold that just a minute. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher. Now, Romans 10 says, go with me to Romans 10, verse 13. Romans 10, 13. For well, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call on him for what? For salvation. Okay. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Okay? Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For well, the preaching of the cross. All right. Now, we know that the cross is the preaching. Now, the cross has a lot of things about it. We're going to get into them in just a minute. And it does a lot of things. But the cross is not the tree. Peter preached that Jesus died and was killed and rose again. He quotes Isaiah 53 in 1 Peter chapter 2. He, he does a lot of things. So if I follow Peter, I'm going to find out that Jesus died and rose. Okay? Some people say, uh, I believe that Jesus died and rose again, okay? Why did he die? Well, he died for my sins, okay? How many of them? All of them. Well, then do you confess your sins? Well, of course, because they're not trusting the fact that if he died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day, that was enough to satisfy God. They do not trust that because they don't know. They just know the Facts is that Jesus came to the world, the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world, died for their sins, was rose again the third day, and that they can say that, and then uh, then they go about their works. And if they not in church, they believe they've fallen away, and they need to get back in church. Now, what, what I heard that statement many times. I need to get back into church. Get back into what church? 
I mean, there are thousands of churches out there in America. What church do I need to get back in that will secure my relationship with God? What, what will secure my relationship with God? Which church? I've got to find out which church I need to go and get back in church. Are they making a generalization? Well, yeah, they probably are. They're making, I, I need to get back in my church. What is your church? Well, it's that church over there, which is Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, whatever that I go to. Why did I pick it out? Well, I like the people in it. I like the church, the way it looks. On and on, and I like the preacher, and the preacher, uh, he impresses me, dresses well, he has a great enunciation of words, on and on and on, my church, okay? But Paul didn't say, if our church be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. He did not say, it pleased God by the foolishness of singing to save them that believe. He did not say a lot of things that they say is the way it goes. That's not, he, he didn't say that. Well, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, 1 again, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. Okay? So the cross to a believer is the power. The power of what? The power of salvation. So when he said in Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. So a person had to believe that that cross, something on that cross, something at that cross, something the cross did. Well, what did the cross do? Well, he died for our sins, okay? So it wasn't we gave our life or turned from our sins. He died for our sins, okay? Now, turn to 1 Corinthians 15. And remember, Paul is the preacher, the apostle, the teacher, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand. Now, he's not going to leave us in doubt of what he preached to the Corinthians. And in verse 2, by which also are you saved, he's not going to leave us in doubt of what he preached to the Corinthians. And this was the way that God saved them. He's not going to leave us in doubt. Why? Verse 2. By which also you're saved. If you keep in memory what I'm preaching you, unless you believed in vain, okay? A vain believer will not remember it. It did not say a non-believer. It said a vain believer. A person that believes in vain, he believes that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again the third day, but he also believes there's something else that goes along with it because he's been encouraged in this by preaching. And so he believes in vain. Now, how do you know? I, I just read. He didn't say them that believe not. He said, unless you believed in vain, uh, a vain belief. A vain belief could be somebody in a church that says Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, rose against us. And he may say Jesus Christ died for our sins. He may say it exactly right and still not get it because the way that it was brought forth, not in simplicity, not someone saying to you, here's the good news of your salvation. Christ died for our sins according to the scripture and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to scripture. God is satisfied. You're forgiven. Trust him. Not trust him like that's it. You're done. You don't have to worry about it. It's trust him. And then they say, you need to come up here, come up front and give your life to Christ. Giving your life to Christ is not the gospel. Turning from your sins is not the gospel. Confessing your sins is not the gospel. Joining the church by water baptism is not the gospel. What is the gospel? Well, it's plain and simple. Verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. The preacher, the teacher, the apostle is saying also there. I also received. He's giving them something that he received and was told by the Lord to give to them in Corinth or anywhere else he went how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 
That's what he said saved. That has nothing to do with anything else. There is absolutely nothing else that makes salvation clear. Okay? Now, in a church, if that gets read, God saved the person. And he may know that that person may never grow. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you stay a babe the rest of your life, a babe in Christ. You're saved. You're saved, and some other things happen. We'll look at them in a minute. But being saved, you're a baby. That's the milk that Paul gave. Now, whether you want to grow or not is entirely up to you. Now, a lot of people see things that are wrong and never do anything about it. Some people see things wrong and do something about it. God knows them too. But never fear. The gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. Growth is the second part of 1 Timothy 2. He would have all men to be saved. The God of this world cannot stop salvation if the gospel is heard. But he can really fool with growth and to come to the knowledge of the truth, the knowledge that Paul had about the truth of the God. All right? Now, so we've established that. Go back to 1 Corinthians 2 and watch. Like I said, this is simple. But it is all around you. First Corinthians two, uh, first Corinthians one, verse eighteen. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. Okay. Now, verse twenty one. For after that, in the wisdom of God, this is his foreknowledge. This is what he saw. The wisdom of God, the world knew not God. All right. Uh, uh, well, by or after that, in the wisdom of God, the world, by wisdom, okay? Now, wisdom is something that is taught that you have to have understanding, worldly understanding, the preacher's theological understanding to be able to teach. And you got to know the Greek and Hebrew and philosophy and psychology and sociology to lead people to the Lord. Now, number one, the people... Uh, the people are, are led by the wisdom of this world. Now watch what he says here in verse 21 again. For after that in the wisdom of God, this is what God saw about the world as he looked at it. He said, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. They made him into other things, according to Paul in Acts 17 and Acts 7, Stephen and, and others. They made images and they and they worshiped God in images and things that they made with their own hands. And, uh, you know, they couldn't just submit to the fact that God, who made the world and all things therein, sent his son and his son died for their sins because they don't see their sins the way that God saw. Uh, the the uh, scribes and the Pharisees. Uh, no, the uh, the Pharisee went into the the church or the temple and prayed thus with himself. I thank God I'm not like other men are. Why wouldn't you be? Why wouldn't you be like other men are? I mean, you're born of Adam too. Uh, wherefore, by one man sin in the world and death by sin so death passed upon all men for all of sin. You're a sinner. Why are you up there stating? I thank God. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other men, especially that. That publican there back there in the back, uh, he's, oh, he's horrible. He, that's just a horrible man. I, I, people in church think that. They think about people in there that they don't do, that, that, why are they here? They don't deserve to be here worshiping my God in this place. And that's the way Jews felt about Gentiles. You, you don't have no God. You don't have my God. My God is God, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're outside. You're, a, you're uncircumcised. You're unworthy. You, you, you shouldn't be here. You shouldn't be even asking me nothing. Don't talk to me. And even the the uh, the thought is, uh, you don't, you don't have no God. Just get away. I mean that's true evangelism, right? 
And so the Corinthians, the Lord is showing through Paul that God looked in his wisdom and saw that the world by its wisdom would not know him. And that isn't all. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. Now, wait a minute. I'm confused now. The foolishness of preaching. Let's get this. Let's get this in our mind. The foolishness of preaching. Preaching is all around me. All right, you're sitting in your house on Zoom. How many churches are within 30 minutes of you? And all those churches have preachers. Preaching then to the world is not foolishness. I mean, people go there. They drive. They come. They they give up their time on Sunday morning or Wednesday night. Some churches, I mean, they got Tuesday night, Thursday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. I mean, they're dedicated. People come. Well, then preaching is not foolish. What's he saying here? The foolishness of preaching. But you have to go back. The preaching of what? The preaching of the cross of verse 18. He saw God's wisdom that if his son died on a cross, and that would be the God's way of saving them. He saw, they saw that would be foolishness. And also look with me in verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. He knew that was the only way that man could be saved. Man, uh, got my phone over here making noise. Man did not want Jesus. And they killed him. Why would God let his son die when he came to the world to set up a kingdom? I mean, this is, this is, what kind of God is it that would let his son die? And, and how could that take care of me? Because Jesus was obedient. He was obedient unto death. And he became the sacrifice that God would accept for you and I. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Well, that looks foolish to people. So if you just preach the cross, if you just, uh, like I preach the gospel every time I preach. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. If I preach that, there are some people that get tired of that and they go off somewhere else because it's not deep enough yet we know that's the deepest thing in the bible because it is the one hid the devil hid it and it was hid in the scriptures by god so that the devil couldn't see it so he got done what god wanted done for us and when the devil found it out this is what we find in first corinthians 2 5 that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. There it is, the wisdom of this world. The wisdom of man says, yes, Jesus died for our sins, was buried, rose again, third day. You need to come up, come forward, join the church, or turn from your sins and give your life to Christ and uh, lay your sins on the altar. All those are religious terms. Just not... And, and Billy Graham used to say, come up, and people would come up without. Now, you at home, you just stand there by your TV, and you confess the Lord. Okay? Well, why do the people at Billy Graham's got to come up to him, but the people in their house can go to the TV? Is that the TV is the medium between him and Billy Graham, them and Billy Graham? Is it that you can't just sit there in your chair be in your car or be in your room or even be in a bathroom or taking a shower and all of a sudden it hits you like a rock. Somebody else died for my sins and was buried and rose again the third day. And God satisfied, amen, Lord, I'm saved. Accepting what God did. Now watch verse 5, 1 Corinthians 2, 5. That your face should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, so here's a wisdom that's being spoken among them that are perfect. Perfect mean those that have eternal life and know it. Eat yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes that come to naught of this world that come to naught, 
But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. That's the wisdom of God, which none of the princes of this world knew for. Had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. He's explaining the God of this world did not know that the crucifixion was for you. He wanted the death of the Lord to be the denial of Israel so that God would take the kingdom away from him. He believed in the Old Testament that the only way the world could come to God would be through Israel. And if he could get rid of Israel, the world wouldn't have a chance. And God made a chance for the world in reconciliation of 2 Corinthians 5, 17, in the death of his son. And he led him. He spared not his own son. Romans 8. 31, 32, 33, all the way down to 39. And the devil found this out. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, when he found out, this is what he did. 2 Corinthians 4, 3, but if our gospel be his, hid to them lost. Okay? Our gospel. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's our gospel. Peter's gospel, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins, and you should receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's preached in the churches, along with the fact that Jesus died, buried, and rose. But you need to repent, okay? You need to repent and be baptized. And the issue is, are you saved by water baptism? Well, they were in Acts 2, but you have nothing to do with water because water is not your invitation. The invitation is the gospel of Christ, and that invitation's hid. In whom the God of this world that blinded the minds of them which believe not. Believe the gospel is enough. Or believe in vain. Or believe not. Hmm. You see, believing in vain is believing not. That it's enough. God did enough. Jesus Christ did it all. God satisfied. Perfect sacrifice. God said, you want it? Yes, Lord, I want it. You're saved. And being saved, nothing can separate you from me. That's why I wrote Romans 8, 31 through 39. But now let's look at some things. Um, so it's not just preaching. It's the preaching of the cross. Because all churches preach. They take the Bible and preach and water it all together and apply everything to us. And uh, one of the things they must avoid, though, is that Paul is our apostle. Because if you find out Paul's our apostle, you might find out what he preached. And if you find out what he preached, you can get saved. And if you get saved, you're going to learn some things, if you allow it. Now, the preaching of the cross, turn to Galatians chapter 5. What is it about the preaching of the cross? Well, let's see. Galatians chapter 5, verse 11. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I suffer? Why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. The offense of the cross was that circumcision would do no more, do any good. Well, let's, let's, let's just, I mean, this follows why they're being called fools in, in the Galatian letter. They heard the truth. Uh, look in Galatians chapter 3, verse uh, 2. This only would I learn of you, receive you the Spirit by the works of the law, by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now, uh, are you now made perfect by the flesh? That's what I'm saying. If somebody's in a church, Baptist, Methodist, I don't care what church they are. If they hear the gospel of Christ... And they are the called. Now, I understand. The called is the answer. If God calls them, even in that church, and I say that because that is not the house of God. The most high dwells not temples made by hand. They are not told to go there. They're told to do that by God. But his gospel is still the power. And if they're the called and they're in that church and they hear that gospel, they can trust it and be saved. Now, will they come out? Will they grow? Or will they just stay babes? That's up to them. You have a letter to the Corinthians, chapter 3, 1 Corinthians 3, that tells them, it's an instruction that 
you're in Christ, but you're carnal. Your your carnality, a carnal mind is lost. A spiritual mind is saved. Carnal is a spiritual minded person that's walking after the flesh. He's doing what the flesh is telling him to do by instruction, you might say. And a carnal individual, not carnally minded, a carnal individual won't grow. And that's what Paul writes the Corinthians. See, every one of the Paul's writings have some instruction, reproof, or correction, or instruction in righteousness. And it's part of the knowledge of the truth. Okay. So in Galatians chapter uh, two, uh, three, did you receive the spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Verse five, he therefore that ministereth to you the spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Circumcision, look at Romans 10. Now here's a classic example of what people won't do. In Romans 10, one, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, they might be saved. Or bear them record, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. See, they're going by the wisdom of this world, which the Jews at that time believed that they were God's people and that their circumcision was their relationship to God. They were in a covenant. Uh, they were given the promises. Yet they said, we have no king but Caesar crucified. They're the ones that killed the Lord. They're the ones that denied the Lord. They denied the Messiah who could have set the kingdom up for them, okay? But yet they're still going around, being their religion, stumbling at their table, the offering table. They still believe that they're God's people, even though they're in a fallen state, a diminished state, and in a castaway state. And verse 2, For I bear them record to have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. The zeal, zeal is not a factor in salvation zeal don't save you that's another thing that bothers people you can have all the zeal in your church you want and that doesn't save you at all uh the emotion of zeal oh i'm so happy i'm here and doing these things zeal does not save you verse three for they being ignorant of god's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believeth. God will give you his righteousness until you see the end of the law was taken care of by Christ. And you have to submit to that. And that's, that's what the Jews were having trouble with that Paul went to. I mean, Paul went to the Jews first. Paul went to the Jews that are going to be the called, the elect, the remnant. And God knew them. And he sent Paul to them. And when he did, the power of God unto salvation was the gospel of Christ. And when you tell a Jew that Christ died for his sins according to scripture and was buried and rose again the third day according to scripture, he's either going to get it by the power of God, or he's going to reject it and be angry. And remember, they hated G uh, hated Paul. And there's a reason. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believe it, to the Jew first and also the Greek. And a Jew would have to submit unto the righteousness of God, which is Romans 3, 20, 21, and 22. He's going to have to give up. He's going to have to submit like Paul did, if you think you have something to fresh eye of a brag eye more, he listed them all. He said, I count it all but dumb to get a Jew to count everything he did in his life as an Orthodox Jew, as dung. It takes the power of God. The gospel is a powerful, powerful thing. It doesn't seem like it. It's just some simple, basic words. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That sounds very simple, doesn't it? Call the simplicity of Christ in 2 Corinthians 11. Yet it's so powerful. And the God of this world knows the power of it. He hides it. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world blinded the minds of them, which believe not lest the light of the gospel of Christ should shine unto them. Now, 
So in Galatians chapter 5 again, look with me. The gospel of Christ, preaching of the cross, is offense. Verse 11, Galatians 5, 11. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross cease. The gospel, the preaching of the cross, is offensive against circumcision. The gospel of Christ is offensive against baptism. The gospel of Christ is the preaching of the cross is offensive to church membership, things that people do, working their own righteousness, trying to keep their relationship to God on and on. The offense of the cross is there. Now, look in Galatians 6, 12. And as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ does not include circumcision. The cross of Christ does not include baptism. The cross of Christ does not include church membership. The cross, the, the offense of the, the, uh, the persecution of the cross, those things that people do are a show in the flesh, according to the verse. Not doing them, you'll suffer persecution. Not preaching them, you'll suffer persecution. Okay, look with me in Galatians 6, 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. The preaching of the cross is the glorying, as he said, glorying in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The preaching of it. You're glorying in what he did, not you. I say, are you saved? And they say, well, I joined the church. I got baptized and, and uh, became a member. So forth. I said, no, I, I didn't ask you that. I said, what is the gospel of your salvation? Who are you going to give glory to? Is your glory going to be to Jesus Christ or is your glory about what you did? Hmm. All right. Look with me in Ephesians 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 16. And that he might reconcile both unto God in the body, in one body, by the cross. Okay. By the cross, everybody is unified. Neither Greek nor Bond or free, Greek, male, female, all one. Ephesians 4, there's one body. One body comes by the preaching of the cross. The God's world knows that. He loves division. Now the Corinthians, hold here and go to 1 Corinthians and watch. The Corinthians were being reproved by God through Paul. They have a division among them. 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no division among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Okay? They had the visionary problem, and they were contentions among them, and they were, I'm this guy, I'm this guy, I'm this guy. And that's today, it's still the same thing, and, and people... Uh, have their preacher and they follow that preacher and fine, that's fine. If the preacher's putting out all the effort and all the work to do it, sure, you should uh, uh, exalt him as that, uh, uh, mark him as someone that causes you to see Paul, that's fine. But there's division that comes from it and, and a lot of people won't. They won't do this because it's not their preacher. They won't do that because it's their preacher or I'm Paul, I'm a Cephas, I'm uh, uh, uh they said, I'm a Paul, I'm a Paulus, I'm Cephas, I'm a Christ. Now, let's say I'm a person sitting in a church. The gospel of Christ is read. Preacher's trying to emphasize something in the Bible. He reads the gospel of Christ. 
And I'm not saying the preacher believes it or doesn't. That's not the issue. If the preacher believes it and he does not preach it as the power of God unto salvation, woe unto him. If he's a God-called preacher and he doesn't preach it, woe unto him. That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 9, I apologize. But this person hears the gospel. They're in a Baptist or a Methodist religion, and I'm just using up to it, it doesn't matter, whatever religion they're in. And they trust it because they hear it, God's power works on them. They begin as a babe, like we talked about. And then they get to visionary. They begin to accuse those over there. Paul's got a judgment on that. He said, judge no man. I don't ever say that person's not saved because they don't come here. or I, That person is uh, goes to Baptist church that he's not saved. I had a man tell me one time, I walked into the house to see his mother. She had just gotten remarried and her husband had died and I knew her husband. And the son was was standing there in the kitchen and he's ornery. He's an ornery fellow. And he knows the truth. He's heard it. And he, I walked in there and he said, look, it's mom's preacher. He's, he, oh, that's that preacher that believes they're, they're the only ones going to heaven. And I looked at him and I said, the only people going to heaven are saved. And you know what that man said? I know. He was doing that for a show because there's some other people in the other room listening. Because he made a decision many years ago that he had a chance to go to church, Bible study, whatever. He gave his wife a choice. Wherever you want to go. She chose the Church of Christ. And he's been going there ever since. And he knows they're wrong. Now, does he know now? I don't know. I don't know how bad he's been polluted. But for him to say that many, many years ago, I know he knew the only people going to heaven are saved. Well, that's a horrible thing to have to make fun of one to make a show in the flesh and instead of saying, hey, there's a preacher, he, he believes that Jesus Christ died for his sins, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. No, he never gave that testimony. He said, they believe they're the only ones going to heaven. Well, you hear a lot of things from people. And people sometimes fall away. And when they fall away, they say a lot of things. It's hard to, to really get the truth out of them sometimes. Unity is what the preaching of the cross is. Uh, again, Ephesians 2, and he says in verse 16, and that he might reconcile both unto God by one body, in one body by the cross. The cross puts people together. Well, then that brings to mind Ephesians 4, verse 3, endeavor and keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. The bond of peace, we're all to be together. We're all to speak the same things. We're all to have the same mind, same judgment. No divisionary problem. See, again, the books that Paul writes are for reproof and correction, instruction in righteousness. So there's unification in the cross. Look at Philippians 2. The cross unifies and the God's world divides by hiding the preaching of the cross in its simplicity. The preaching of the cross is the gospel of Christ. Okay. Philippians 2, look with me in verse 8. Philippians 2, 8. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Obedience of the cross. Jesus said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. It was the will of God for him to die for our sins. Jesus said on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in the same breath, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. 
and he died. He gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world, being reconciled to God by the blood, the cross of Christ. And it became obedience. Now look at Colossians chapter one. And Jesus Christ was obedient from the time he knew right or wrong. I mean, a child, we understand their mind's a little different. I cannot explain to you the mind of Jesus Christ as a, as a baby. I don't know the mentality of him versus man. Um, there's, I mean, he's the son of God from birth, but he called the son of man. So he lives like a, a man in a sense of tempted in all points, like as we are yet knew no sin, but from the time that he, before he knew good to receive good or evil, good or bad, or on and on. So a child, yes, a child has a time to where they come to the knowledge of, of needing something. I don't know that about Jesus. I'm not going to try to blow smoke in the air and tell you I know what Jesus knew as a baby. He's the son of God. But I do know that he took upon him the form of man and in flesh and blood and lived as a man. And he suffered the things of man and he was tired. He was hungry. He was disappointed. I mean, all the things that he experienced in life, tempted by head on by the devil in Matthew 4 and succumbed, no, held against him with it's written. He didn't succumb to him. I mean, Jesus is put in a position by the devil that he could have been afraid. But instead, it is written. I mean, he's hungry. What if God don't feed me? You know, the doubts that people can have. I want you to think about Jesus there has been fasting for 40 days and he's hungry. What if God don't, what if the Father don't give me nothing? He didn't doubt that. It's written. He said the word is more important than the bread alone. I mean, how many people got that attitude? Bread is more important than the word. Things are more important than the word. Going somewhere is more important than the word. Every class that you have, you learn something. And if you don't, I believe you're telling a big one. You learn something every time you open that book. Because God's book is knowledge. And to put things in place of the word is what humans are. Jesus did not do that. He said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded forth out of the Father. He desired to do the will of the Father. Do you? Do you desire to do the will of the Father? Have you done the will of the Father? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you believe that what he did was enough? Then you become a baby of Christ if you do. And in a baby of Christ, you should grow and become a full-grown man. Full-grown man is, is the representation of Paul's writings. There are letters he writ, wrote first for babes in Christ to grow on. And then when the other people became part of the body, they became one new man. And they grow up in the stature of the Lord. And when that stature of the Lord is fulfilled, we're gone out of here. I mean gone because the unity of the faith is accomplished as in Ephesians chapter three, uh, four, uh, verse 13, till we come to the unity of the faith. Well, while we're in the unity of the spirit by the, by one spirit, are we all baptized in one body? We're to keep that unity by the cross. Now he said in first Corinthians, uh, no Colossians one twenty. Colossians 120, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Peace. Now, it, we, that's another study altogether, that peace. Uh, Romans 5, look with me in Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, we are justified, uh, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The first people that trusted Christ were at peace with God. The Colossians now are at peace with them, with God. You see, they were at peace, the first believers. We 
who came along later are at peace with them with the peace of God. That's how it works. And he made peace between us because we have the peace of God also, peace with God. The peace of, of God is available to us that believe, Philippians chapter uh, three, uh, 4, the peace of God comes to those that are at peace with God. If you're not at peace with God, Romans 5, 1, and you haven't become part of the unity by the blood of Christ, uh, Colossians 1, verse 20, uh, having made peace through the blood of his cross, the knowledge of Paul, referring to the fact that these Colossians who he never went to, didn't know, had trusted the gospel, and they had been made peace with him, him and the body that first trusted Christ, by the cross of Christ. And if they've been made together, there's the peace of Romans 5 with God that the Colossians should have never had. We in this Zoom class should have never had peace with God. There's no prophecy about that. God did it by grace. He let us have peace with God when he made us peace with the other believers. He put us together. Unity the unity of the cross, one body, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, the unity of it. We've been put together, and that peace together makes all of us have peace with God. Because Romans 5 was given to those that first trusted Christ. It was given to us when we heard the gospel of our salvation and trusted. We had the peace with God, and we had become peace together with the other believers, making one body, waiting for the stature of Christ to be fulfilled that we can get out of here. So there's peace. Uh, look in uh, Colossians 2.14. He said, blotting out the handwriting ordinances that were against us, which were contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The mystery. While Jesus was hanging on that cross, God saw the whole body. But the whole body didn't get saved at one time. It's progressive during the book of Acts. And that progression had to do with the fact that those who first trusted Christ were to give glory to God and to be charitable. Because God knew what he was going to do when Paul said, Lo, I turn to the Gentiles in Acts uh, 28, which he had sent him far hence unto in Acts 22. And those Colossians who he never knew were having problems with legalizers and had, trying to put the ordinances on them that were handwritten. And he said, Let no man judge you in meter and drink, blotting out the handwriting ordinances, verse 14. Nobody knew. The devil didn't know that those handwriting orders were blotted out by the cross because nobody knew what the cross was doing, except God. And when James wrote the four orders, it was to keep everybody happy in the book of Acts, because the Jews around them weren't happy with the Gentiles that first trusted Christ, because they weren't doing anything, because in the body you don't have to do anything. So he wrote four ordinances to keep them Jews happy. That doesn't do with salvation. But then there came a time when the Jews had no more advantage Acts 28, lo, I turned to the Gentiles. And the true apostleship of the Paul came forth. And he wrote letters in prison because he's in prison for the Gentiles, which he had turned to, that everybody hated. And yet God had loved and reconciled. And God gave those aliens, strangers, the right with peace with him, being reconciled as in the world, put them together by one spirit and made peace between them, had instructed those that first trusted to have charity to accept them. And he gave the, the Colossians to put on charity for those that they were being put together with. And what's amazing, Ephesians and Colossians, they loved the saints even though they were strangers. 
And first Thessalonians told them, I, the, the spirit need not teach you. God need not teach you to love your brethren because you do. That love's there. Love your brethren. Don't you have that? Do you have the love for the brethren? If you don't, I'll be something wrong. I'd already examine yourself and see whether you're in the faith or not. Say Corinthians 13, 5. And in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, blotting out the handwriting order says are against us. Don't, don't worry about them. And don't judge somebody if they do, and don't let them judge you if they do, if they do. Now, in order to read this, let no man therefore judge you in meter and drink respect to holy days, then they shouldn't judge either. And what they should do is go to the word of God and work it out and show. And he said, study, Timothy, study to show thyself to prove unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. Show both groups of people how they got in the body. Show both groups that the ordinances are gone, blotted out. Show them they're in unity and show them to love one another. To have charity for one another. Let there be no division. Be not judgeful. You see, Timothy had all of Paul's writings. And in having all of Paul's writings, he had great instruction. He had the knowledge of the truth. Now, the uh, look in 1 Corinthians, uh, no, Galatians 1. Now, here's what comes. First, in Galatians chapter 1, verse uh, 7. Uh, no, 6. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that would trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Why would they pervert the gospel of Christ? Because it's the power of God unto salvation. And the God of this world is going to deal with the minds of people that one day they trusted the Lord and got sealed. And instead of looking to see what the book says, they let men influence them. Verse 8, But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. <clears throat> For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if yet I please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which is preached to me is not after man. For I never, I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hmm. Verse thirteen. For if you have heard of my, uh, for you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Jews' religion came out. The Jews' religion didn't like Paul coming out. They liked him when he persecuted the people uh, that trusted the fact that Jesus Christ was the son of God, the gospel of God. The Jews' religion didn't like that. And Paul began to suffer there, and he began to really suffer when he preached, not only did you kill the Messiah, Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and he died for our sins, according to Scripture, was buried and rose again the third day, according to Scriptures. And you understand that every lost Jew could have been saved. I bear them record. They have a zeal of God, but not according to God. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is they might be saved. When he went to the Jews first, he wanted them all to be saved. Just like you want your neighbors saved, your friends saved, all that. You can't make them saved. You can't get them saved. The gospel of Christ, the power of God, and salvation to everyone that believe it. And the knowledge of the truth is that we're, and I'm just go through these, dead to sin, Romans 6. There's no condemnation, Romans 8, 1. We're heirs of God. Romans 8, 15, and 17, that there's no separation, Romans 8, 35 through 39, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 and 18, that comfort one another, words, we, we show shall we ever be with the Lord. Romans 8, 23, we have the first fruits, which is the Spirit of Christ. And here's the big one. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, you're sealed. A babe in Christ in a church that hears the gospel of Christ and trusts it may not ever find out he's sealed. 
And if he don't know him sealed, he can be tossed to and fro, but he can also be worrying and doubting. He needs to be taught the knowledge of truth. It's the will of God for him to come to the knowledge of the truth. No preacher worth his salt is not going to show you that you're sealed. The second, the moment you trust Christ as your Lord and Savior, God seals you with that Holy Spirit promise. And it's the mind of Christ that's in you. It'll bear witness with you. It'll mediate for you. It'll intercede for you. It'll lead you. It'll bear witness with you. It teach you. And on and on. You see, you need to be saved. That's the will of God. And come to the knowledge of the truth. So when you run into people that go to church and they surprise you and say, well, Christ died for my sins. Then show them the simplicity of it and how they have to trust it to be sealed. Amen. Amen, Jerry. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm.